Hello, I'm David Ellenstein. I'm the Artistic Director of the North Coast Repertory Theater in Solana Beach, California. A couple of months back, we did a reading of a short play by the retired judge, the Honorable H. Lee Sarakin, who served on the United States District Court, as well as the Court of Appeals. He wrote a play called The Race Card Face Up, which exposes an injustice that has occurred in our judicial system. The theater has donated our resources and our time and the actors have donated their skills so that we could make a recording of this play for you to see. At the end of the play, there'll be a link to a clemency petition that we're hoping to get before President Obama. If you are so moved, we hope that you will sign that petition. And now, the race card, face up. This is TV station WCOL bringing you an interview from the Federal Correction Prison in Florence, Colorado with five of the six defendants known as the IRP-6. You will also be hearing from a family member at a remote location. The warden has kindly given the prisoners the right to wear street clothes for this interview which the families have provided. You will first hear from Mr. David Banks and then the others in turn. Mr. Banks. My name is David Banks, and I'm serving an 11-year sentence at the Federal Correctional Complex Prison Camp in Florence, Colorado. I've lost everything. My business, my money, my family, my future, my church, and my freedom. Everything but my faith. Nothing in my life would have predicted me being labeled a criminal and a convict. I guess I'm what you'd call a army brat. My dad was in the U.S. Army for more than 20 years. He loved and respected it, and so did I. He served two tours in Vietnam, volunteering for his second tour. My mother is a pastor who taught me Christian values. I went to the University of Colorado, but left before I graduated and enlisted in the Navy. I was assigned to the Naval Air Control School, being one of two students who scored 100% on the entrance exam. I graduated the top of my class. I ultimately was stationed at the Willow Grove, Pennsylvania Naval Air Station. After about three years, my father died, so I left the Navy and came home to take care of my mother. I had friends working in the information technology and I decided to pursue a career in that field where I spent the next 14 years working as a software consultant, doing work for MCI, AT&T, Verizon, WorldCom, IBM, and the Supreme Court of Nevada. I then decided to work with my brother-in-law, Gary Walker, on a very exciting project, and through no fault of his, that's where the nightmare began. My name is Gary Walker, and I'm serving a sentence of 11 years in the same prison. Just like David, service to our country was in our history and in our blood. My father was in the Air Force, and I dreamed of being a fighter pilot from about the time I was nine. President Ronald Reagan granted me an appointment to the United States Air Force Academy. I couldn't make it as a pilot, though, because of my poor eyesight. So I completed my education at the University of Colorado, obtaining a degree in computer science. After college, I worked on what was known as the Star Wars Project at Martin Marietta. I was assigned to the National Test Facility at Falcon Air Force Base in Colorado. I helped design and develop key software components to the Star Wars program created to defend against nuclear attack. I personally met and demonstrated the program to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, and French Prime Minister Pierre Joux, hardly the precursor of a life of crime. Just an aside, not only were the six of us all devout members of the same church, there was not a single criminal charge or conviction among any of us until these unbelievable events unfolded. I went on to spend my time after Marietta, now Lockheed, as a senior software consultant for numerous Fortune 500 companies. My name is Clinton Stewart, and I'm serving a sentence of 10 years at the same prison in Colorado. 
It's fitting that we lived, prayed, and worked together that we should end up dying together because that is what prison is for us and our families. I don't think future criminals suited me either. I was brought up in a very hardworking and very religious family. I joined the Air Force after a year of college. After seven years of service, I was selected for a special agent assignment overseas while serving as a crypto systems engineer at NORAD Spacecom. Unfortunately, I had to decline because my father fell ill. I requested a hardship separation and was honorably discharged. I love the Air Force and my work there. Once back in the States, I had an excellent and active career as a cybersecurity expert, technologist, and consultant before joining this group. I am Kendrick Barnes, and I am serving a seven-year sentence at the same prison in Colorado. I was the chief information officer at IRP Solutions, the name of our company. I have 15 years prior experience in information systems management, software development, systems integration, and architecture. I've done work for companies such as Sendant, Merkle, Western Union, and Comcast Communications. My father, too, was a retired vet who spent 22 years in the United States Army with two tours in Vietnam. I was also a member of the same church for 30 years, as were and are my friends and business partners. Also, please permit me to brag about my wife, Tisha Barnes. She is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, class of 2004. She served as a cadet squadron commander in her senior year. She is part of a long military tradition. Her father was a decorated war veteran, an army ranger, her grandfather was a Vietnam veteran and a Green Beret. Her mother is a retired colonel in the United States Medical Service Corps and served in the Pentagon and the Office of the Surgeon General. I am Demetrius Harper, and I am serving a 10-year sentence at the same prison. Likewise, I had 15 years experience in information technology. I attended the University of Colorado from 1993 to 1998. I worked for companies including Oracle, Compact, and MCI WorldCom. I joined IRP because I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to launch a new and successful product and at the same time aid law enforcement and protect the country. I attended the same church for 30 years and served as a minister there as well. My father also served in the U.S. Army. At the age of 20, he served in South Korea. He was an instructor at Fort Lewis and served an extended tour in Vietnam. Every school he attended while in service, he graduated in the top 1%. After only 17 years of service, he was selected for the Sergeant Majors Academy, something I understand is unprecedented by Army standards. Four of my uncles also served in the armed forces. So let me describe what it is uh, we were trying to develop and sell. It was highly complex, but I'll, I'll try to simplify it. One of the great failings that led to the catastrophe of 9-11 was the failure of various government and law enforcement agencies to share information. There were numerous articles written about the failure and the need to develop a system that would help coordinate essential information among all law enforcement agencies. So I decided I would try and develop a software solution that would revolutionize the way law enforcement agencies collaborated and shared information. I eventually labeled it Investigative Resource Planning, IRP. After years of development work, we demonstrated it to anyone who might be interested including members of Congress, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and several police departments, including New York and Philadelphia. The interest was great, but each had suggestions to comply with their own needs. In order to satisfy those requests and uh, requirements, we needed more programming. We contracted with staffing companies, a very common practice, to provide the expertise we needed. Everyone we dealt with knew of our financial circumstances. We were a new company and a new venture. We were optimistic about our projects and, and relay that enthusiasm to the staffing companies. But please understand this. The staffing companies hired and paid 
the employees. We didn't get the money, except some hourly payments for work we actually performed. The only way we could ever make money is if the program were completed and a success. I can say without hesitation that we intended to pay every staffing company with whom we contracted. We believe there were multi-million dollar contracts out there available to us. There was never a moment when we engaged a staffing company without expecting to pay them eventually and in full. We never denied owing the money or that, or that we were late or, or, or slow in paying. Everything was taking much longer than we expected. But we never intended to cheat anyone. Our only crime was optimism. And that optimism was based on the interest and promises we received from prospective customers. So you may well be asking, how did we all end up in prison? It all started with a letter dated March 8, 2004, from a former U.S. attorney to the current U.S. attorney. He said we were guilty of fraud and outlined what he claimed it was. We, of course, didn't see the letter at that time but we have seen it since. What we found strange was not only this charge of criminal activity out of the blue, but the fact that nowhere in the letter does he say whom he represented. To this day, we don't know whether it was a claimant or a competitor. Somebody asking, who are these small-time, uppity black guys playing with the big boys for these huge contracts? But that was just the beginning for us. What came next was in the form of a surprise FBI raid on our business on February 9th, 2005. It is difficult for me to describe that day for you without being emotional. 21 agents stormed through our offices, rummaged through our files, took our intellectual property and seized our records. They confined us in a lunchroom while they took our life's work from us and eventually, our lives. But strangely, months later after the FBI literally has everything about our business, apparently some staffing company requested that the FBI conduct a criminal investigation. And what did the same FBI office conclude, as we all contended, rightfully so, that this was a civil matter, and they declined to proceed further? The letter dated August 8th, 2005 says, we regret to inform you that we are unable to assist you in this matter and therefore no investigation will be conducted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We feel this case would best be handled civilly. Signed, Richard C. Powers, Special Agent in Charge, Denver. Despite the FBI's conclusion that this was a civil matter, Someone unbeknownst to us was pushing it hard and the charges were submitted to a grand jury in March of 2007, some two years after that first accusatory letter. The grand jury undoubtedly arriving at the same conclusion that this was simply a debt collection matter refused to indict, something we are advised is a rarity in the world of criminal justice. And this was despite the fact that starting in December of 2006, the FBI began targeting members of our church at their homes and jobs, and many of them were called before the grand jury to testify. Everything was being done to bring us down. And then in June of 2009, four years later, they finally got a grand jury to indict us. This time, they only called one witness, an FBI agent. And the old adage that a prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich was proven. Afterwards, in order to dissuade the prosecution, we submitted a complete proffer, detailing everything we had done, said, written, or possessed that had any relationship to the charges. If they paid any attention, it completely exonerated us. But it fell on deaf ears and blind eyes. They were out to get us, and there was no convincing otherwise. So you must be asking why? Why are you all in prison serving terms from seven to 11 years? The answer is we failed to pay our corporate bills. That's really our crime. 
One thing we never denied, we owed the money. We had every intention of paying it. But the only way we could do so is if the business were a success. Everybody we dealt with knew that. We were a lousy credit risk unless we became successful. And we thought we were on the brink. We had a commitment from the Colorado Bureau of Investigations for $375,000. Unfortunately, they reneged. But we did have a $12 million verbal agreement for a pilot project with the Department of Homeland Security. And a couple of months before the FBI raided our business, they asked and received a quote for two software modules that exceeded $100 million. Additionally, we had the promise of a multi-million dollar deal with the New York City Police Department. But the indictment, the leaks that preceded it, the FBI raid, the seizure of our work, our files, our software, ended all that when word leaked out that we were raided and under criminal investigation. So in essence, it was the government which prevented us from honoring our obligations. Obligations we always intended to honor. I won't bore you with all the details of the case. Essentially, the government argued that we were a sham. We were con merchants. That there was no viable computer program and that we lied to the staffing companies about our prospects in order to get them to pay programmers to work for us. Can we ask you some questions? If you were going to run a scam, do you single out only law enforcement agencies as your pigeons? If you're going to cheat people and sell them some snake oil, do you start with the police, the FBI, Homeland Security? And do you work for years on a project with friends and family, spending all of your time and your money, borrowing small amounts from friends and family and fellow church members? Do you personally guarantee the debts to the staffing companies if you never intended to pay them? Would you hire two retired FBI agents and a former immigration customs official to work inside as independent contractors to help develop and improve the system? Would you hire and pay two major law firms to represent you? Would you take the time and incur the expense to travel to law enforcement agencies all over the country to demonstrate your program? And would you lease space of, of 10,000 square feet for $20,000 per month, decorate it, and invite law enforcement representatives to an opening? Would you seek investment capital, lines of credit, and create an investment prospectus? And explain to me, how do you make money having staffing companies pay the employees directly? Even the government had to concede we made no money on this alleged scheme. Here's a quote from the U.S. attorney in his opening statement to the jury. The evidence isn't going to show that the defendants got fabulously wealthy from this scheme. How true. The government did present evidence from the staffing companies that we claim we actually had contracts, something that we denied. But despite the government's claim that we built staffing companies, the truth is, out of the $5 million paid by staffing companies, we each averaged, for work we actually did, about $50,000 a year for two years. That's it. Some scam. That's a fraction of what we could have made working for other companies. 88% of the money paid out went to programmers and consultants, not us. The only way we could have made any money is if the program were a success and we had paying and satisfied customers and contracts. There was no way for us to make money otherwise. It's like saying we were constructing a building, hiring contractors who paid their employees to build something that we never intended to finish or sell. If it was a scam, we were the stupidest con man ever. We were certain that the prosecution could never convince a jury that we were criminals, or that the program was a fake, or that the staffing companies had been intentionally built. We were so convinced that we fired our court-appointed lawyers, all of whom wanted us to plead guilty to something we had not done. We decided to represent ourselves, having faith in the justice system. I know what you're thinking. 
we were stupid. But we were innocent. No one was going to convict us. We're afraid you won't hear us out if we recite everything that happened at the trial. So we want to tell you one incident that will give you a flavor of what we confronted. The government concluded its case earlier than predicted by offering evidence of the charges mentioned before. They brought up the fact that we use multiple corporations and some billing practices to make us look sinister. But the heart of the case was that we were a bogus company out to scam the staffing companies. As a result of their early finish, we were not ready with our defense and we were scrambling for witnesses because the court had unexpectedly denied allowing our two expert witnesses to testify. The denial supposedly based on our failure to properly notify the prosecution. Although both experts were on our witness list and both had furnished letters to the government outlining their opinions regarding the staffing practices. We asked for delays and the judge became very impatient with us. At one point she said to us that either we produce a witness or one of us would have to take the stand or our case would be closed. Here was a threat from the court that could end our case. We could caucus and decided that one of us had to testify. I testified and then Gary objected. A Donnybrook broke out because Gary said our Fifth Amendment rights had been violated by compelling us to testify. The judge said she had not said anything of the kind and we demanded the transcript. We were all absolutely unanimous in our verbatim version of what she had said. She denied production of the transcript for that day and at the time, some 200 pages, but assured us that they would be produced at the end of the day. The transcript of that particular conversation in the courtroom between us and the judge has never been produced to this day. We were told it was missing. It was available, but they would not turn it over. That it had never been recorded by the reporter. That we could not see the original notes, etc. A million excuses, but never the transcript. We even started a civil suit against the reporter on the ground that we had paid for the entire transcript and had not received it. The suit was dismissed. Neither the court reporter nor the U.S. attorney ever filed an affidavit testifying as to what was said or what happened to the transcript of that conversation, and neither has denied our version. The silence speaks volumes. The judge has said she doesn't remember her exact words. Everybody concedes that she said something, including the judge who heard the civil matter seeking the transcript. He concluded that no record of the conversation existed. We have no doubt what it was. Of course, the testimony, the objection, and the subsequent refusal to continue testifying all took place in front of the jury. How do you think a jury reacts when one defendant testifies and another objects on the grounds of self-incrimination? Try winning that case. You have heard the sentences that we received. Seven to 11 years. Seven to 11 years. Did we kill anybody? Did we rape anybody? Did we assault or rob anyone? Aside from us and our families, the only ones that were hurt were the staffing companies. They weren't paid what we owed them and we regret that. And there were many other companies involved. Some stopped doing business with us when they didn't get paid, so we had to find others. Forty in all, but we were confident of success and didn't want to give up. I know any story should have some humor. This isn't funny, but it is laughable. After we were sentenced, we were denied bail. We were flight risks. We had lived in the same place virtually all our lives. Our extended families and our families lived here. We had all belonged to the same church for the last 15 years. We had no money. We could barely afford a bus ticket to the next town. 
the government had taken everything that made it possible for our business to survive. But we were declared flight risks and sat in prison from the time of sentencing to the decision on appeal. The guilty verdicts were rendered on October 20th, 2011. And the decision from the Court of Appeals was not rendered until June 30th, 2014. The day we were all waiting for. Time to go home. My name is Kaya Banks, and I'm David Banks' daughter. I'm here to represent the wives, the sisters, the fathers, um, the brothers of these five men, and to tell you their stories. And trust me, if they were here right now, you'd be bawling. But we don't want sympathy. We want outrage. We want justice. My father was sentenced on July 27, 2012. And I was not allowed to go that day because two of his friends had been sentenced. And they had been shackled and hauled away. And neither of my parents wanted me to see that. And believe it or not, I was accepted to college that very same day. And I called my mom at court to tell her the news. And she said at that very moment that they'd taken my father and hauled him away. And I can't describe all the ways that I miss him. I can't call him in prison. He has to call me and then calls are limited. To multiply that sadness for six families. Prison. You hear about it. You read about it. But it's indescribable once you're actually there. Everything I own fits in a locker that is waist high. My bed is about the size of a baby's crib. And is either metal or on a concrete slab. I'm told when to eat and who I live with, where I can go, what I can do and not do. My cellmates have not been charged with violent crimes, and yet they can be as frightening as a convicted serial axe murderer. I've been strip searched so many times that I've developed immunity to it. Prison is a place where Lost appeals and unrealized hopes cause us to lose the will to make it another day. While we are here, we all know that our families are likewise serving time. Neither us nor them for crimes committed. Here's a letter from Yolanda Walker, Gary's wife. I was in court when the verdict came down. It never occurred to any of us that it would be guilty. I just went numb. I was in total shock. My brother David looked at me and mouthed it was going to be okay, but it wasn't. I didn't know how I was going to tell my son and the other children. My hands were shaking so that I couldn't text the word guilty. Then they put shackles on their wrists, their feet, and around their waist, and they were all shuffled out of the courtroom like some chain gang. That's when we all lost it. That was the worst day of my life and I relive it every day. How could this have happened to my husband and these other sweet, hardworking friends? How could this have happened in America? Everything has been taken from me and is now gone. So in my heart, I have to let everything go for the time being. Nothing here belongs to me. I can't provide anything for myself. But somehow, I still feel the need to live and make the best of a terrible situation. Here you are constantly surrounded by depressed resignation, which tries to steal your hope away. It's like a sickness that is contagious and you could catch it just by walking by other inmates. Thank God for my family and those friends of mine who always preached God. Because right now, that's all I have left. Daisy Bowden, Kendrick's mother, raised her son in the church and taught him how to respect his elders and the laws of the land. And every Sunday, she would cook this big meal for him and his wife, and then they would spend the whole day together. And now, she just spends every Sunday missing the key coming through the door, and just missing him. 
I find it ironic that there are signs all over this place with the words Department of Justice. We all should be in facilities that say Department of Injustice. I know that family values have taken a hit lately. Politicians who profess it but do not practice it. But faith remains. We were all brought up to be believers, to trust in God. I just celebrated one of my birthdays in here. It was just like any other day. I ate a little, terrible food, slept not very well as usual, worked for 18 cents an hour, talked with friends, listened to the news, and prayed. I wore my same green shirt, green pants, black boots, no cake, no candles, no tie or sweaters, no family, no singing happy birthday. But I know, we all know that we have family, friends, church members, and a whole community that cares about us. The fact that we're not abandoned or forgotten is what sustains us, keeps us sane in this crazy world. But we didn't give up hope. The total lack of any evidence of criminal intent, violating a criminal defendant's Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination, combined with the foul smell of the critical missing transcript, it would be hard to believe that any court would ever let this verdict stand. We had waited all this time for the appellate court decision, but it would all be worth it on the day we were set free. It was just a matter of time, of being patient, of believing in God and justice. On the way. It finally arrived. The Court of Appeals had decided. We were going home. Wrong. Convictions affirmed. Evidence supports convictions. Missing transcript irrelevant. The court said we had another witness, an FBI agent sitting and assisting the prosecutor throughout the case that was on our list and we could have called him. He was also listed to discuss the scope of a search warrant, hardly the heart of our defense and certainly not one of the desirable lead-off witnesses. So they ruled we didn't have to take the stand, even if the judge said what we said she said. No harm, no foul. Game over. I cannot recite for you all of the false and misleading evidence that was marshaled against us at the trial, but let me give you one example that the appellate court relied upon in affirming our convictions. The government claimed that I used the alias Rico Howard in obtaining money from the staffing companies because my name was next to his in the parentheses in our records. The truth? Enrico Rico Howard worked for us as a software configurations manager specialist and was paid directly for his work. My name appeared next to him because he reported directly to me. But this was the type of evidence that was used to make us look sinister, convict us, and have the convictions affirmed. Have you ever felt betrayed? Have you ever had your faith in mankind and justice destroyed in a single moment? I can't list the way we all felt at that moment. We were patriots. We and our parents had served our country in the armed forces. This project was to help the country. Sure, we hoped to make money, but the thought of protecting the country was just as important to us. We were religious. We were family men who loved and respected our parents, our spouses, our siblings, our children. We were black men who defied all odds, worked hard, got educations, never in trouble with the law, gained experience, and formed a company. And they whipped us, just like the old days. This is a letter from Sarah Harper, Demetrius's mother. We raised Demetrius in the church since he was three. His only sister died at the age of 13 from a terrible illness, so he's all we've got. He always worked hard, sometimes working two jobs to make a good life for his family. 
My heart aches every time we go to visit him at the sight of him in green prison khakis. The same for my husband, his father, who served in the Vietnam War. And there's such hopelessness in our son's eyes. And none of us can believe what has happened, that our funny, bright, outgoing, energetic son is in prison for a crime he did not commit. I think I should mention that we weren't totally abandoned. A group known as A Just Cause did everything humanly possible for us. We could not find any outside lawyers or innocent projects to represent us, but a very nice young African-American lawyer, Gwendolyn Solomon, agreed to help us pro bono on the appeal and again volunteered to petition the United States Supreme Court. Our hopes were diminishing. We knew it was going to be a long shot but there was no other place to go. But there on the very first day of the new Supreme Court term in October 2014 was our name and docket number under the long list of petitions. Denied. Braylon Harper, age nine, son of Demetrius, asked me to tell you this. When he was seven, his dad went to prison and he said, I'm really sad because I have to leave him at that place. I wish my dad could come home. I miss him and I want to play with him, run with him, watch movies with him. I feel bad for my sister Kayla who can't play soccer anymore because my mom can't afford it. We maintain our faith despite everything. Do we think this happened because five of us are black? I don't know. But an FBI agent did ask me during a raid whether we would hire a qualified woman if she were white. We don't know who or why someone pushed so hard to see us indicted and convicted. But let me ask you this. Car companies have killed people. Rig explosions of oil companies have killed people, destroyed the environment and business. Cigarette companies have killed and harmed millions of people. Banks and brokerage companies have destroyed life savings and deprived people of their homes. How many of those executives were indicted, convicted, and sentenced to prison? How many white executives go to prison for 11 years for not paying corporate debt? Even if the jury believed that we lied to the staffing companies, how do we gain from that except to improve our program so that we could sell it and pay them? I don't want to play the race card. But will somebody explain to me why six guys, five black and one white, with no criminal record, no intent to defraud anyone with our backgrounds, get indicted, denied bail, pending appeal, convicted, and receive unbelievably harsh sentences, unless it has something to do with the color of our skin. Our lives, our families have been destroyed, basically because we owed money. Somehow, I don't feel this happens to white people. We don't suggest that the judges involved were biased against us because we were black. Maybe race had nothing to do with it, but, but if it played a role, it was deeply embedded into our case long before it got to them. I suppose you noticed that our white brother, David Zeropolo, who worked with us for years and, and was an indispensable part of our team and was a fellow church member, uh, isn't here for this interview. Why? because his friends and family believe that he wouldn't be here in prison with us if he hadn't gone into business with five black brothers. And I suspect they may be right. I wish that I could be more articulate. I wish I could express the heartbreak that we all feel it's to how inconceivable it is to us and the families of these men who worked hard all of their lives, 
pursued an education, who were all church members, who loved and served their country and wanted to make it better and safer, who were wonderful brothers and fathers and sons have ended up in prison. And we don't want to believe in an America that the men like these were prosecuted and, and persecuted because they're black. No, they weren't shot by policemen, but for us, it's, it's, it's as if they had been killed. And they weren't even wearing hoodies. <laughs> they wore blue suits with white shirts and striped ties. But now they're just slaves again. Hi, I'm Ron Christopher Jones, and I have the honor of portraying David Banks in the race card face up. Hi. My name is Mark Christopher Lawrence. It's my pleasure to play the role of Gary Walker. Take action. My name is Anthony Gordon Hamm, and I have the privilege of portraying Clinton Stewart and Judge H. Lee Sarekin's reading, The Race Card Face Up. I urge you to take action now. My name is Walter Murray, and I'm playing Kendrick Barnes. Please hear our story. My name is Lawrence Brown, and I have the honor of playing Demetrius Harper. Take action. My name is Naime Kamara, and I read Kaya Banks, and I'm asking you to take action. <laughs> 